So um, I'm just going to talk about um, eminent domain. I've been doing just a little bit of research into eminent domain um, regard, in regards to my research. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so no law training, so I'm just sort of approaching this from a layman's perspective. So. All right, so eminent domain is pretty much just mandatory sale. Um, it's the power of the state, along with taxation and police powers. Um, it's also known as compulsory acquisition or expropriation in other countries. And there's few details um, about the system of eminent domain from the ancient world, probably just because um, people in power just took what they wanted back then. Um, it's traditionally used to acquire land, but it's also on occasion used for other forms of property. Um, so tradition, some traditions are brought from England. Um, there's the Magna Carta up there. Um, the Magna Carta required immediate payment for movable property and a banned takings on wood, horses, and carts, but it didn't actually um, talk about land at all. Um, it also brought, in, uh, brought up the idea of due process. And the first statute that actually um, dealt anything with eminent domain was a statute in 1427 for the restoration of sewers in London. Um, it just briefly said that land could be taken if they needed to add um, new sewers. Um, another statute in 1512 allowed for coastal defense to be built and expressly said without compensation. Um, so maybe that, that they put in that um, compensation was not allowed, maybe that lends us to believe that you know, people in 1512 would expect compensation. Um, and they didn't actually get one unified um, eminent domain law until the Land Clauses Act of 1845. Um, before that, it was a project-by-project project specific. So say they needed to do a project, they would um, pass a law allowing them to do it. Um, and they slowly <clears throat> developed a tradition of compensation, but there was no actual public use requirement in their laws. Um, I'm in a domain in colonial America. Uh, Massachusetts is passed the first law in 1639 um, for highways and specifically prohibited destruction of homes, orchards, um, and gardens. And it offered compensation only for improved land, so say a field or something with, um, I guess, ideas on land ownership were a little bit different back then. Basically, you can't, you know, you can't, if you didn't do anything to improve the land, the idea is that land really isn't yours, so don't really owe you anything for it. Um, and New Jersey and Pennsylvania got around the issue by just saying when they would grant somebody a piece of land that they would just say we reserve the right to take back 6% of it if we need to make um, roads. So they, I mean, the people that made that deal knew that was part of the expectation. Um, and in, in many cases, they didn't actually get compensation for land. And actually, up until 1836 in South Carolina, um, they could take both land for roads and material for roads from private citizens with no payment. And there were. Um, Another big area of eminent domain use was um, mill dams. What a mill dam is, is just like a dam built across a river or a stream, and it would, um, uh, it would power a mill, essentially, to grind corn. And pretty much the mill dam acts would allow people to um, you know, build a dam, but that would you know, flood your upstream neighbors. And you could just take that, that land through, essentially, eminent domain. And you would have to pay them, but they, they had essentially no right to stop you. Um, and it was originally started out with um, uh, mills for like grinding corn, and there there were specific rules saying you know you had to accept everybody's business, and you had there was regulations on um, prices. 
So it was almost thought of like as a public utility. But as time moved on, they would use it for other things like, um, you know, making loom, powering looms, powering, um, you know, other large plants that really didn't have a, a public use, but, you know, they were justified on economic grounds. Um, and there is a history of public and private takings, the, the mill dams being an example of, of private takings. All right, eminent domain in the U.S. Constitution. All right, the Fifth Amendment reads, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And the original draft actually read that no person shall be obligated to relinquish his property where it may be necessary for public use without compensation. So the key difference here is necessary. Um, there's not really much, there's really not much evidence on why they took out the word necessary. Maybe it was just to use less words. Maybe they actually intended to change the meaning. I guess we don't know. And um, so the key, two key terms in there, uh, what's public use and what's just compensation. And there's a whole string of, of court cases that dealt with these. Um, and it originally only applied to the federal government. Um, pub, first case, first public use case, coal uh, versus the United States. Oh, another thing I should say, there's many more um, eminent domain cases that are, um, that the Supreme Court has heard. I just, um, <coughs> tried to find a few that um, I felt represented, you know, the evolution of eminent domain law. Um, so there's land for post office in Cincinnati, and the courts decided that it was an inherent power of the federal government. Like, it wasn't explicitly listed in the Constitution that eminent domain was one of their powers, but the court uh, felt that it was an inherent power. Um, they can take state. They can take land within a state, uh, as long as they're exercising powers conferred to it under the Constitution. And before this time, just as a, a general policy, when the government, the federal government, wanted to do something, um, it would just get the states to provide the land. And also, um, just a little minor detail, they decided decided that there's one trial per piece of property. So if a property had several owners. Um, they, they all did go, go together in one trial. Um, so another public use one, Cherokee Nation versus Southern Kansas Railroad. Private company can be given the power of eminent domain by the federal government to serve the functions of the federal government. Um, eminent domain can be used to construct railroads. And all lands held by private persons are subject to taking by the federal government. Um, another one, Shoemaker versus the United States, 1893. Um, land for parks in the District of Columbia may be taken for, uh, may be taken for parks, I guess that's a little redundant, but, um, uh, and so the concept of aesthetics of a community as a public, as public use comes. And here's another one with a park, um, U.S. versus Gettysburg Electric Railroad Company. After, um, you know, of course, oh, sorry about that. Um, so Battle of Gettysburg was probably the most famous battle of the U.S. Civil War. Um, Congress wanted to preserve the, the battlefield and um, put up some of these plaques, um, you know, designating the important like, camps and battle lines of the battle. Um, and they also wanted to make some roads to make these uh, plaques accessible, so they had to take land from the um, Gettysburg Electric Railroad Company um, court held that taking land from a private railroad company to preserve the Gettysburg battlefield is valid. 
And here's a couple quotes. When the legislature has declared the use or purpose to be a public one, its, its judgment will be respected by the courts unless the use is palpably without reasonable foundation. And they also said, um, any act of Congress which enhances the respect and love of the citizen of his country and to quicken and strengthen his motives to defend it must be valid. Basically, their argument was uh, by preserving um, the Gettysburg battlefield, they would, um, you know, encourage and you know cause so much pride in um, the citizens that they'd be encouraged to fight uh, for the country. Um, here's a real interesting one: Clark versus Nash. Um, condemnation of private land to build a private irrigation ditch. Basically, what it was was. Um, I believe this was um, Utah, and so it's very arid. So without um, water, the land is essentially worthless. So um, the state of Utah passed a law saying that you could build a ditch across your neighbor's property to get water from a river. Well, it went up to the Supreme Court, and the court said that different standards apply to different um, parts of the country. And they said, so, um, they held it was valid and they said, but we do not desire to be understood by this decision as approving of the broad proposition that private property may be taken in all cases where the taking may promote the public interest and tend to develop the natural resources of the state. Um, but, you know, in modern times, we actually have moved to that direction. But this one um, approved a, a, private a strictly private taking. Um, and this is another interesting one, Brown versus the United States. Do you have any quick question for the previous one? Sure. So, so even though the court said that, they did the opposite. Well, yeah, they said, um, they said they didn't want to make it like a broad case, but for this particular case, they ruled in favor of, of the guy that wanted to, to make the ditch over the, his neighbor's property. And then presumably this was cited as precedent. Exactly, yep, you're similar exactly similar correct. <laughs> Yep. Um, yep. So this is another interesting one. Um, Brown versus the United States. This established the concept of substitute condemnation, and it pretty much is exactly what it sounds like. Um, so they wanted to build that dam, and in the process of building that dam, three quarters of American Falls, um, Idaho, were to be flooded. Land adjacent to the remaining town was condemned to remake the town. Um, so basically, they you know they're flooding this this reservoir, um, and they have you know they have to pay or they have to make the owners of the town whole, so to say. So they had the idea that okay, well we'll just condemn the land around the town and make a new town there. And that's pretty much exactly what they did. Um, and there's a similar case. In um, in Maryland, so with sorry, how, so they condemned the land around the town and built the new town. And built the new town. Yeah. With whose money? Well, the the federal government's. Okay. But and then they just moved everyone there. Yeah. Yep. So the guy that the the people within so they the, basically forced them to relocate <coughs> to an adjacent. Spot. Well, yeah, but the the people in the town actually weren't um, too upset with it. It was the guy that owned the land around the town. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you know he it was his opinion that. You know, this doesn't have a direct, um, you know, my land doesn't have to be taken to build this reservoir. It just, they thought it was the cheapest, <clears throat> the cheapest and most convenient option for the government. And the whole town just wanted to relocate like that? They really didn't mind relocating? No, I mean, because the government actually moved most of the buildings, so I think. Um, mm -hmm. So, so wow. say that again, who, who was upset about this? The, the person that owned the land. That was condemned. Not the as far as I can tell, not the people in the town. So this is for remaking. Yeah. So they con they condemn the land around the town to take from the the owner, and um and use to remake the town. And it was just one. Um, I'm not sure if it was one or a couple. They bought some, but a couple didn't want to sell. Was it not? Was it like out of curiosity? Do you have information on what type of land that was, or what different owners were, or? 
I, I'm not sure. No, it doesn't really matter. I, I, I'm just from the area, I would bet just maybe like grassland or grazing, but it could have, it very well could have been farming, farmland. But yeah, so that, yep, that was their, I guess they decided the cheapest option was just to condemn land that wasn't directly involved in the project. Um, another interesting one, TVA versus, versus Welch, 1946. Um, so the TVA, which is, has everybody heard of the TVA before? The Tennessee Valley Authority, they pretty much build um, hydroelectric dams in the Smoky Mountains. So they wanted to flood a valley which um, would cut off uh, a community by flooding the only highway in. Um, so constructing a new road was possible, <laughs> but at a cost disproportionate to the value of the public, and labor was limited um, due to World War II. And I think this was, um, I think it was North Carolina, but I'm not sure. And they, I guess they had an obligation to provide roads for everybody in the state. Uh, I guess a statutory limitation or obligation. So instead of building a new road, they just decided to, um, most of the community was bought out, but holdouts property was condemned and the land was given to the national park. So instead of, instead of building the road, they, pretty much the state, the county, and the um, federal government got together and they decided, well, even though um, you know, founding national parks isn't part of the TVA's, um, you know, that's not really in their job, they decided that their, their easiest thing was just to condemn the land and give it to the national park. I'm curious, I don't know the history very well, but was the TVA, like, uh, like was it under state? Of Tennessee, or was it the federal federal, federal project? Yeah. Um, so now we're getting into the big three of the 20th century: Berman versus Parker, um, District of Columbia. They had the District of Columbia Redevelopment Act of 1945. I guess um, a lot of the District of Columbia had substandard housing, and they wanted to, to change that. Um, non blighted department store condemned as part of a comprehensive redevelopment plan. Um, and this is the big quote. It is with, within the power of the legislature to determine that a community should be beautiful as well as, well as healthy, spacious, as well as clean, and well-balanced as well as carefully controlled. So pretty much, um, oops. So this, you know, the, the department store wasn't, you know, it was a fine business. It wasn't blighted or um, run down or anything. But the court's opinion was that these redevelopment plans have to be done as part of an overall plan. And they can't um, go on a, a plot by plot basis to decide what can be condemned and what can't be. Um, so now this is another big one, Hawaii Housing Authority versus Midkiff, 1984. Um, at that time, most of the land in Hawaii was controlled by small oligopoly. Um, homeowners owned their homes, but they actually leased the land um, that the home was built on. And the state compelled the sale of the land to the homeowners. And this actually, so the whole idea behind this law was to, um, you know, cause property values to go down. But what happened was um, now that there is a clear title on the piece of property, um, they are now very attractive to Japanese investors. And, um, but yeah, so the, the price has actually skyrocketed for, um, for a period there. It looks beautiful. Yeah. I can see why. <laughs> So yeah, so this an, another example of unintended consequences, and then this is um, this is the the one you probably yeah, yeah this is a big one. Kilo versus the City of New London, um, economic development in the City of New London. Um, so they wanted you know to revitalize the community because there's a new Pfizer plant, the drug company moving in, um, you know, and they a lot of highly educated high-income people they figured were coming in to work at Pfizer, so they figured, you know, they'd redevelop the area, put in condos, you know, shopping center, restaurants and stuff. 
Um, and the owners weren't holdouts, you know, in the traditional sense. And they didn't really want more money. They just didn't want to sell their, their homes. And, you know, they weren't, they also were not opposed to the development. They, you know, they'd be fine with them putting up the development around their homes. One owner was actually born in her home in 1918. And she's lived there her entire life, or she did. Um, and her husband had lived there for 60 years. Um, and, and so the Supreme Court in 2005 okayed the taking, but in the end, Pfizer had a merger. Um, I don't remember exactly with who with, but so they no longer... Was it Merrick? I think so, yeah. So they no longer needed their, that research facility, so they, they abandoned it. Plus, they also had some tax um, abatements that were going, about to expire. So Pfizer decided to get out of there and not, in, in the end, the, um, the development completely failed, and it's just empty lots now. Yeah, it was particularly shocking because it basically, the Pfizer was almost allowed to like set the rules for like how this all went down. So it was like a private. It was it was it was like it was like the private company um, being able to use eminent domain, but mm -hmm. it was even more extreme than the one you originally did with the railroads mm -hmm. because. In this case, it, they weren't trying to serve the public good. They were just serving their own property. Well, so their, their argument for serving the public good was more taxes. Yeah. So their, yeah. their sole justification... Um, this It wasn't like a specific public good, like providing no. transportation. Exactly. Yeah. So this, this ruling essentially... Um, now, there are state... It varies state by state, and most eminent domain um, stems from you know, state power, not federal power. So in in most states, uh, condemnations like this now are illegal. But as far as constitutional, as far as a constitutional protection, um, if the city feels like they can get more money from your property um, by giving by selling it to somebody else, they can condemn it and, and sell it to the other people. California have an anti taking law. They do proposition. Ninety-nine, yeah. Um, but the problem with, oh, sorry about that. You might just hit your computer. Um, so that has exceptions for blight. Yeah. So, um, you know, and and these development corporations that the state has are quite, you know, clever if they want to use so-called blight. And are you all familiar with the term blight? Just essentially means what it sounds like, just a rundown area, like a slum. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, yeah, now 42 states have limitations on this kind of taking. Um, but specifically, like, ta like sort of st tax specific, or what was the, this kind of? Like economic takings. Okay. So where the just the public good would just be increased tax. These most or all were backlashes to Kilo? Yeah. Um, I think before there were about I think eight laws before and then thirty eight after. This case like it was in like it was reported like yeah. really, really really well. That's a lot of backlash in a short period of time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so California Prop ninety nine. What year was that? 2005. 2005. Oh, no, I'm sorry. What year, what year did, was Prop 99 put in? I think 2008. Okay. But actually, Prop 99 really didn't do anything because um, Prop 99 only protects owner-occupied homes. It doesn't cover, you know, like vacation property or businesses or anything like that. And um, taking owner-occupied homes for... Um, taking owner-occupied homes for uh, economic development was already illegal under this, the California Constitution. <laughs> so pretty much, Prop, Prop 98, so there was two propositions. Prop 98 um, was a much more um, strict um, eminent domain restriction, but they ran into the problem that they also banned um, rent control. So I think by trying to combine those two issues, they kind of shot themselves in the foot. Um, and so the opponents of Prop 98 brought up Prop 99 as sort of a, um, 
alternative proposition. Um, so pretty much public use in the constitutional context means public purpose. Um, so there's no requirement that it actually has to be used by the public. Um, in the history of the states, there's narrow and broad interpretations, but um, in the courts, the narrow, inter or the, or, I'm sorry, that's a typo, the broad interpretation wins out. Um, so pretty much anything you could think of can be called a public, public uh, use. Pretty, pretty much anything short of taking from one person, like a vacation home to give to another person that wants it more. But I mean, maybe even that could maybe be justified if you could say, I'm going to build a more expensive house, so I'll pay more property taxes. Um, and also, the court has given great leeway to the legislative branch for determining public purpose. And this, you know, is an opposed with other constitutional rights. You know, for other rights, you know, like right to a, um, a lawyer, the courts have pretty much set the standards on, you know, what people need. Same thing with First Amendment rights and um, pretty much every other constitutional right. So there's a difference between strict scrutiny. Scru there, there are three kinds of scrutiny, right, that a law can undergo. I, I, mean, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. From what I understand, there are three kinds of scru scrutiny. Um, and the, the reasonable purpose, the, the least, and they're like different ones are for different kinds of things. So for example, if you, and depend on what groups they affect. So if the laws affect like a readily identifiable group, like they clearly affect, affect Jewish people, then there's a standard called strict scr scrutiny where the okay. law has to be like very closely scrutinized. This kind of scrutiny that it seems like this is, um, you said it's like any, as long as the, it's basically, you said, as long as the legislators have like a reasonable purpose. Yeah. And so that is the least strict standard of scrutiny. And that means basically as long as the legislators were in their right minds, right? As long as they had some conceivable justification, even if the justification doesn't stand up to like logical mm -hmm. empirical scrutiny, it can, um, it'll like, it'll stick if it's examined. Yep, and there, the basic idea is the court says, you know, the legislature is elected by the public, so, it, you know, they represent what a public use is. But, you know, the whole idea of a constitution is to protect rights that aren't popular. Otherwise, you know, the... What am I hitting? You know, otherwise, there's no point in having a constitution, you could just have a democracy. So, so Jeremy, does that mean that pretty much, um, and is, is, should there be a land grab by cities in terms of raising their tax revenues? Have we seen some of that? Well, like I said, lots of states, it's outlawed. Um, like 42 states, uh, economic development like that is, is banned. And in the other states, I think it's just been so unpopular that it, it's just maybe died down a little bit. But, but between, I think in uh, between like 1998 and, um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was, it was in the brief for that, that Kilo um, um, case. There was about 3,000 of these ec um, economic eminent domain takings across the country. And you know, another thing is it's mostly used against um, poor people because people that are wealthy enough, you know, first off, they can afford lawyers. Second off, they usually have political influence you know, and they can you know, contact the right people in the media where you know if they use it against people that are poor, they don't have the legal resources, they don't have the social resources. You can't make a blended argument as much. It, well, yeah, exactly. But I mean, like, even even in cases where it's not blighted, they still go after poor neighborhoods. Um, lower price. What? Lower price. Yeah. That's yep. One yeah. Yep. Um, you know, and lots of times, just because I'm in a domain isn't actually used doesn't mean it's not a factor. Lots of times they use it, you know, as pretty much a knife over somebody's head saying, if you don't sell, we will use eminent domain. So, yeah. so you know, it's hard, it's hard to even judge, 
just by the number of eminent domain proceedings. I think your computer keeps going on screensaver. What was that a screensaver? Or like your the screen just turns off. Maybe if I go quick, it'll be fine. So these are the just compensation. Um, so the first one is Barron versus Baltimore. So private wharf was rendered unusable. Pretty much they changed the flow of the river. And this caused a big sandbar to build up in front of this guy's wharf. Um, owners sued the city, but the Supreme Court held that Bill of Rights did not apply to states at that time. And that, I mean, that's pretty, that was a pretty much standard thing until the 14th Amendment. The Bill of Rights, none of the, the rights applied to the states until the 14th Amendment um, and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, so just compensation, Chicago, Burlington, Burlington, Quincy Railroad versus Chicago. Chicago built a road across its railroad tracks and the railroad was only awarded a dollar. And this is actually the first challenge under the 14th Amendment and the first example of incorporation, basically um, bringing the Bill of Rights rights and applying them to states and local governments. Um, the taking was upheld. And this is, this is an interesting case because um, they only got paid a dollar, plus they had to put up um, the crossing arms you know, the signs and the, the crossing of guards. So it was a big cost. Yeah, it was a big cost to them. And they said that was incidental to the taking. So that would just be like, well, it's just like if the, the city put up a regulation, you'd have to do it anyway. Um, Bauman versus Ross. Um, so this is another in, ingenious one for them. In partial takings, so meaning like if they want to build a railroad across your property, any increase in the value in the remainder can discount the awards. Um, so with this, they pretty much were able to build railroad tracks and essentially pay the owners of the land nothing because they could argue, well, now your land is more valuable because you have access to a railroad. You should pay us. Exactly. <laughs> they, I, they never did that, but pretty close. This has been argued with three ways. Yeah, has it? Yeah, quite a bit. No value until there's a freeway. Now you've got frontage road, really yeah. property. You can build a fireworks stand out there. <laughs> I think there's one in Tennessee about that. Interesting. Um, and they, they also said there's no right um, to a jury to determine value of your property. So it's just the judge. Well, or not even a judge. It could even be. Um, it's just a legislature. That, yeah, they can set up committees or whatever. Oh, good um, great. Uh, ta and also taxes may be assessed on the land benefiting the project, so long as notice is given and um, a hearing is given. And this was all to build highways within the District of Columbia. So the wait, you could, Sorry. so they could get money from the taking, right? Because they look, they can discount and then they assess your land for new taxes. Well, yeah, benefit. exactly. Yep. Excellent. <laughs> um, They'll take your land and make you pay. Wonderful. <laughs> so, Olson versus United States, compensation does not depend, or, okay, the compensation does not depend on the uses to which the owner has put the land, but upon all uses for which it's, it's suited. So this is actually defends the owner a little bit, say if they have um, a lot of land that could be used as farmland, but they just have as a vacation um, property, they have to pay you the most valued use that that it could conceivably be put to. Or if you use it, and it works the other way too, right? If you get a small land, but it could be a really valuable vacation home. Yeah, exactly. They have to pay you what the, well, the highest. The highest, yeah. Like the best use. Yep. And this does not include um, uses that can just be imagined. You can't just be like, well, maybe I'll open up, I don't know. A hotel. Yeah, a hotel or something. Five-star hotel, there, I'll be full every night. Is there some clause that says something about uh, like you have to pay a certain amount times the market value of it? Nope, nope. Actually, I think that's this one. So just compensation includes all elements of the value uh, that inhere in the property, but does not exceed the market value fairly determined. And the amount, uh, so about market value, it's the, the amount that in all probability would have been 
arrived at by fair negotiations between an owner willing to sell and a purchaser desiring to buy. So it's like, never mind the negotiation, but anyway, this probably would have been. Well, and that's another, you know, there's a good reason why you don't see for sale signs on every house, um, you know, in America, because usually the owner values the land, values the house more than the market value. Right. If, they if not, if they'd, sold, already, they they'd already be sold, sold. yeah. That's right. It's like on Zillow, you can list a make me move price. Like if someone really likes your house, you can specify, like you can make me move if you'll pay me. Yeah, exactly, yeah. People don't even do that, so. Yeah. Well, why would you? Because there are other people who are willing to sell for less than that price. Well, but I mean, a house is a very specific good. No, no, that's true. But in general, you, you, would, you would expect that the people who live in the house wouldn't want to move for the market price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if, if they would, they would they would sell their house. Um, so the Kimball Laundry versus U.S. So government took temporary control of a large like industrial laundry facility during wartime. Um, so they pay the company the lease value and wear and tear. And in this case, the court held that in some situations, companies are entitled to lots of intangible property so long as it was transferable. And their, their argument was they had these, um, you know, they had regular customers that they served. And the, the fact that, um, the fact that they lost um, their facilities for the year, or for those three years, um, you know, meant that they lost a lot of customers because, you know, of course, the customers are gonna have to find somebody else to do their, their laundry um, during those three years. But if it's just like a taking, like actual taking of the business, um, then the court said that, well, you know, they can just open up shop somewhere else. So there's, you know, there's, they usually don't get money for goodwill in, in most cases. Um, so U.S. versus Commodities Trading Corp. That's some black pepper in case you didn't know. Um, in some situations where commodity is subject to a price control just compensation is determined by the price ceiling. So this guy, this uh, Tremides Trading Corporation owned a large supply of black <coughs> pepper. The government seized it and paid him the ceiling price set by the price control, which was actually less than what the, um, than what the guy paid for it. Yeah. Um, Why did the government seize it lower? Because it was World War II. Oh. They wanted the um, pepper for the army. When was the price control instituted? What? When was it? Yeah, when was the price control instituted? Oh, this... Um, all, all because of World War II? Or yeah, all, all because of World War II. Yeah, so well, it was back in the... When did the case start? Like, when did the taking happen? I think it was 44 or 45. Oh, okay. So yeah, it, it had to work its way up to the courts for a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so basically it just, like, basically, well, because the war was on, they instituted the price control and then said, by the way, we're taking your black pepper and we're paying you the exactly. price Exactly. Yep. So the government set the price, <laughs> and then the government took it and paid the price. Right. It's by definition not the price of the good. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I guess I'm not an expert on black pepper, but I, I'm pretty sure that it can. It's a long shelf life. So I think their plan was just you know to wait out the war, um, and then sell it. And pigs. part part of the um, part of the price control law said that um, a person can't be compelled to. To sell their their property, oh, really? but I think that was you know meaning like you know person A can't compel person B to sell their property, not the government can't compel you. So um, U.S. versus Fuller, nineteen seventy three. Owner not entitled to the market value of land created from holding federal grazing permits. Pretty much, this guy owned a small piece of property. But he he owned these these grazing grazing permits that essentially allowed him to have a huge ranch with a lot of cattle. So you know, and it was a really valuable ranch, and you know he could have sold these permits; they're they're transferable. Um, but um, when the government took his land, they said, "Well, these these permits are revocable, and the fact that you only have a small piece of land means you couldn't have a large." ranch on the small piece of land, so they only had to pay him the value of the, the small piece of land and the ranch that he could support with a small piece of land. And what did the government want the land for? I don't remember in this case, but they wanted it for some reason. 
Um, so what's the limit of eminent domain with, with economic takings? Um, and depending on the state, there's essentially really no hard line limit on eminent domain. And in my research, I found one sort of um, funny one. If I mean, it would be funny if it wasn't sort of scary. So City of Oakland versus Oakland Raiders. Um, Oakland Raiders wanted to move to LA and that was like a whole big issue. Um, it went into court um, with the NFL because the NFL didn't want them to move. Um, but also the City of Oakland tried to use eminent domain to seize the Oakland Raiders, not like the team. The team, so not their the real property, team. not, you know, a oh, specific yeah, piece of property. Yeah, practically enslavement? I mean, yeah. oh, we're going to own you now. Yeah, they yeah. said they wanted, you know, it's essentially intangible. A franchise is intangible property. I mean, all the individual players could have left. Well, yeah, exactly. But, I yeah, mean, but like, they would have owned the franchise. They didn't have yeah, they would have owned the name. Players, and, and, yeah. It's just a big deal, yeah. yeah. So, actually, they... Um, <coughs> The court, the court held that, um, not that they couldn't do it in general, but they stopped it for a couple of reasons. One, they said it interfered with interstate commerce. Um, two, they said, and this was a California court. Two, they said that the. But it was uh, all in California. What? All the movement was in California. Yeah, but they, but they, they said that because they, you know, it's so in, you know, doing, they do business. Interstate by definition, because well, they, yeah, <clears throat> um, so they said that you know the state couldn't you know do a regulation like that, and they also said that the um, the California eminent domain law didn't specifically authorize you know taking of a football team, but if it did, it, there's nothing on the grounds that um, would have made this an illegal taking. So like theoretically, if, if I wanted to move my business from one town to another, and the town wanted to stop me. Or the California wanted to stop me. Yeah, so the Cal if the state of California, I, I'm sure it would or go. Wait, no, the, what about the city? Like, what if I wanted to move my business? Yeah. My business, like, I own a dry cleaner. Yeah. I want to move it from Oakland to LA. So. The, the principles they used to not, in this case, wouldn't stop them in that. In that well, I, I guess they would say that it didn't specifically authorize the city to take a business, but that would probably be more doable. But. There, the court didn't say that, you know, if there, if the state of California said it would have been okay, then I'm sure the court would have tried, allowed them to try to do it, and then it would have gone to, to federal court. But, um, and then, so one more example, this is Pole Town. It's a neighborhood in Detroit. GM wanted a large tract of land, uh, delivered very quickly, plus tax abatements. They had, uh, Detroit had an 18.3% unemployment rate, so they thought, you know, this, this will be great. We'll get a new plant. So GM promised 6,000 jobs. Uh, GM approached Detroit in fall of 1980. I think it was October. And they wanted to clear title by May, May 1st, 1981. So extremely quickly. And this is like 500 acres. What are tax abatements, sir? Uh, so they pretty much they won't have to pay property taxes for oh. several years. Um, so in this Pole Town neighborhood, there were... 3,400 people, um, 1,500 homes, 144 businesses, 16 churches, two schools, hospital, and a, an abandoned concrete factory. Um, so even under the most favorable consumptions, the city would lose money. And they knew, the city knew that they would lose money even under the most favorable um, assumptions. Um, so the Mich Michigan Supreme Court wrote the decision about two weeks Usually decisions, constitutional decisions like this that are this complex, usually take the entire, um, I guess, term of the, of the court to write. Um, well, one year, I guess. I, I don't think they're in session the entire year, but um, several months at least. So it cost the city $300 million to buy it, and they sold it to GM for $8 million. Um, and so the plant made a maximum of, of 3,000 jobs. They so never they made all those people relocate. Oh, yeah. Yep. 400 people in the churches and that. Yep. And pretty much they started bulldozing properties, you know, as they got them. So in this, you know, that seven-month period of time, it was pretty much like anarchy in the neighborhood. There was, like, people's homes right next to big piles of rubble. 
there were fires, um, you know, and it was it was pretty much crazy. And usually, was there, was there a um, well, yeah, and up you know in the sixties and seventies after that that Bierman decision, there are lots of these redevelopments in in cities, and this is. I guess one of the you know first examples that really people really fought back, but they ultimately failed. How so? How did they fight back and fail? Like, did they? Was there any opportunity or ability to appeal a higher court or something? Um, was that just not didn't have time for it or what? I I'm sure they probably appealed to the Supreme Court, but maybe it got turned down. Oh. But yeah, so essentially they once they got that ruling in May, the Supreme Court ruled in May, they just level the area. Yep. Well, at least it, you know, put GM on a solid if not. Thank goodness for the public Why Detroit even did it? Well, because GM said if they didn't build the factory there, they'd find some other city that would. Okay. Still, though, it lost that much, only 6,000 jobs. Like, you could just pay the unemployed people that amount. Well, yeah, exactly. For <laughs> $300 million, it would be... So probably there was, I mean, just guessing, but there probably was also a couple other payoffs. And well, yeah, and I mean, exactly. Another thing is they don't have to worry about really what's good for the community. They have to worry about what's good for their <coughs> political campaign. If they can get lots of money and contributions, that's what they care about. Um, and they also, Detroit, made similar deals with the other automakers shortly thereafter. So. Good Lord. Wow. <laughs> it's a yep, and that's what I have. Amazing. Thanks. Well, that was a pretty good job. Yeah. Uh, Those cases. Oh yeah, it's it's really. Um, what was the 1981? Sorry, the last one. The 1981. Yeah. The, the, Up Pole Town Pol. versus Pole, as in like Polish people. Mm -hmm. Versus. Only one example where they hold in favor. Yeah, very few <laughs> that. And then, um, as far as like when the railroad ones were big in the 1800s, not one time did the the court rule against. Um, takings for railroads. <clears throat> Not a huge surprise given the monopolies that the railroads have ever been. Yeah. It wouldn't be true of electric power lines still, depending on domain it's used all the time. Well, yeah, yeah, but that also depends state by state, too. I guess that's right. Natural gas pipelines, they don't have enough domain. Yeah, they don't? There's something no. particularly incredible about the relocating, yeah. like, two and a half thousand people, right? I don't know why they don't have it, but they don't. So that's not considered a public utility, or? Uh, yeah, well, no, they're not. They're not public utilities. They're interstate natural gas. Okay. They specifically cross state lines, but they've never been able to use eminent domain, so they have to reroute the line. Interesting. Yeah. Have they tried to get? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. They go to for yeah, it's cost them a lot of money. They'll meander a pipe to have you know lay a lot more steel. Sure. What, are there any other players besides large companies that particularly benefit from this type of use of eminent domain? I'm, I think maybe politicians, but... Well, the military at times, right? Like when they, you know, they want a military base somewhere, they go and seize the land. But I mean, it's arguably, that's, that's with... I mean, yeah, it doesn't happen it's, very it often. It used to happen. I think it used to happen. Maybe during the war. Yeah, and arguably that, you know, is the original purpose of eminent domain. Like, I think, you know... There was a, a, a really fun one you can look it up in California, where Highway 85 goes. Okay. South down to Gilroy. Yep. And the land was all taken by eminent domain. And when Jerry Brown was governor the first time, he was going to stop freeway development. So he sold off some of that land right down by where it crosses Highway 17. And really? They decided after he was uh, on vacation, they were going to um, recondemn that land and build the freeway. So they paid 15 times for what they had sold it off for. Really? It's right down there near the prune yard. There's a small piece. And Jerry Brown was going to stop freeway development because he doesn't like cars and doesn't like freeway. Yeah, so there was, it was there with eminent domain. It was sold off and then it was reacquired by eminent domain. Conflict. OK, thank you very much. It's